We have the airplane beginning at point C and then ascending at a 30 degree angle until it reaches point B. Directly beneath point C was that radar station at point A and that altitude was one kilometer. We've also labeled the side lengths with A, B, and C opposite of their corresponding angles. Now we need to find a few of these lengths before we can move on. And to do that, we'll notice that we have a 90 degree angle here and then coupled with that 30 degree angle, if we add them together, then that will make angle C, which is right there, a total of 120 degrees. So let's label that. Next, we're going to find the length of side A. And to do that, we will recall that a length is equal to a rate multiplied by a time. Now, when we say rate, we are simply talking about the speed that the airplane is traveling at. It is going 300 kilometers per hour to kind of trace out this length that we have marked A. And so to find A, all we really need to do is take our rate of 300 kilometers per hour and then multiply that by a time. Now, the time is one minute. We know that it took a minute to go from point C to point B. So we will multiply this by one minute, but be careful, of course, because the hours and the minutes will not cancel here. We need a unit conversion. We all know that one hour is 60 minutes. And if we multiply by that unit conversion, the hours will cancel as will the minutes. So we'll basically have 300 divided by 60. And when we work that out, we can see that A is going to equal five kilometers. So let's label that on our diagram as well. That's great. Now the next thing we need to do is to find the length of C. And to do that, we're going to use the law of cosines. Now you probably learned this equation in a pre-calculus course. We're going to go ahead and plug in all the values. Remember, we know A, we know B, and we know the angle C. So we'll plug them into the law of cosines. So we've gone ahead and have plugged everything in. If we simplify the right-hand side, we would have C squared is equal to the square root, excuse me, is equal to 31. Then we square root both sides we can see that C will indeed equal the square root of 31. So we'll put that into our diagram as well. The next thing we want to decipher is what quantities are changing within our law of cosines equation, as well as what quantities are remaining constant. And to get a feel for what is constant, we might imagine that the airplane continues its journey outward. So if we were to stretch the side that's marked little a a little bit further, you know, the plane might end up about here, and then the distance to the radar station would be much longer. It would be this distance right here. So hopefully you can see that little a is changing and little c is also changing. But quantities that are not changing in this scenario would be the one kilometer as well as the 120 degree angle. So what we'll do is we'll plug in the constant values of one kilometer for b as well as the angle of 120 degrees because those, again, are constants. And then after we do that, we could definitely simplify this equation just a little bit. So on the right hand side, we're going to have a squared plus one minus, and if you multiply two and one in cosine of 120, you'll get negative one. So you'll have a minus negative one times a. And of course, we could simplify that just one more time. We have c squared is equal to a squared plus one plus a. So that's great. Now, the other quantities in our equation, so C and A, they're changing. And so we need their rates of change. Now, one of those rates of change is known. If we go back to the diagram, we again know that this side marked A is increasing. It's getting longer as the airplane flies outward. And it is increasing at a rate of 300 kilometers per hour. So we know that the rate of change of side length A is equal to 300 kilometers per hour. What we're looking for is the rate that the distance from the plane to the radar station is increasing. The distance from the plane to the radar station was C. So we're actually in this question looking for DC DT. We don't know that rate. So keep those ideas in mind. We're looking for DC DT, but we do know DA DT. And we're going to be utilizing those in just a moment because what we're going to do next is take this equation and differentiate it with respect to time. So we'll scoot down the page here. Now, when you differentiate c squared with respect to time, you're going to have 2 times c to the power of 1, and then multiply by dc dt. Make sure that you multiply by that rate of change in c with respect to time. A lot of students do forget that. So we're actually going to do a similar procedure with a squared. When we differentiate with respect to time, we'll have our power rule 2a to the power of 1, and then times dA dt. 
the derivative of the constant 1 is 0, and then the derivative of 1a is 1, but again, multiply by dA dt. So this is great. Now what we're going to do is solve for dC dt, and to do that, we will divide both sides of the equation by 2c. Doing so cancels it out on the left-hand side, and now we have it. We have dC dt is equal to the expression on the right. And the next and last thing we need to do to solve for dc dt is just plug in all of the known values, which we listed earlier. So there we have it. Now we can simplify, of course. On the top, we're going to end up with 3300, and that's over 2 root 31. You can divide top and bottom by 2 to reduce it. So you do get 1650 over root 31. That is the answer for dc dt. We could simplify that and also attach a unit. Regarding the units, remember C was measured in kilometers, time is measured in hours, and then we can actually punch this into a calculator and get approximately 296. And again, that will be in kilometers per hour. So you can report your answer in the approximate form, or you can report your answer in the exact form as well.